how are you all doing this evening? First off and foremost, I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining me this evening. This presentation will be on advanced fuel trim diagnostics. In order to understand the fuel injection system so we can uh, quickly and accurately diagnose these systems, we really need to think outside of the box. You know, fuel injection is about the fuel, right? It says fuel, fuel injection. But maybe there's more involved to this system than what we're seeing up front. So let's start to look at this system and get a better understanding of how it might actually work. The fuel injection pressurizes the fuel base and then it opens a solenoid such as an injector and it allows the fuel flow to go into the engine in a controlled manner where I can actually weigh exactly how much fuel is going to, going to go into the cylinder. So this is really what we're talking about with fuel injection and these fuel injection systems have been around for a long time in both a mechanical format and an electrical one. Both engine styles, compression ignition, diesel and spark ignition, basically gasoline, have both used these systems. We want to cover the spark ignition internal combustion engine during this presentation. In some early fuel injection systems, they didn't have codes and they didn't even have data streams in some of these cars. So we've come a long way and all the later injection systems, they have some code capability as long as well as um, some data stream ability. But how accurate are the codes in these systems? So when we make scan tools, we have to backwards engineer the protocol and the timing sequences so we can talk to these units. In order to do that, I've gone to the wrecking yard and I've gotten hundreds of control units. And what we do is we wire these for the powers grounds and the comm lines. All you need on a computer to talk to that computer is the power grounds and comm lines and then I can communicate with it. So we just have a little connector here and we pull that off and that goes with that computer and then we put another one on and plug it on and this way it gives me the ability to figure out what I need to do in order to communicate with this module. Now what's more impressive than this is something that I see repeti repetitively and that is this system, this doesn't have one wire connected to it other than the power grounds and signals gentlemen. I have no codes. So the first thing you would ask is what about the comprehensive component monitors? They're not working, they're not giving me wires. One of the things you need to understand is for these systems to go into any kind of testing, there needs to be a certain enabling criteria or a way that we can better test these systems for accuracy. That might mean that you're going to need to roll the vehicle or start the vehicle and have RPMs present. So what happens is there's no codes for this. Let's look at a newer CAN system. So in this controller, this is a CAN module. Now we did at least get some codes this time. So now we got codes for the throttle position sensor A circuit low, B circuit high, those could be right. The accelerator pedal motor control range or performance, you really can't have a range or performance problem because you're not connected to anything. And what about forced idle? This system is forcing the idle. We don't even have an engine connected to it where we could force the idle. And here we force limited RPM is what I want you all to understand is these are commanded conditions. This is what it's going to do if it was connected to an engine and if it saw these type of problems. The command structure that's going to be sent out doesn't mean that it was in that it could do it. It means that that's what the program wants to happen. Now these same type of commands are in your PIDs, your data functions. So sometimes it might give you the injector on timer. It says that it, your tranny solenoid is on. It does not mean that that occurred. It means that that's what it wants to occur. So be really aware of this. 
This has to do with some of the program structures within these systems. So if codes don't work or they give me the wrong information, how are we going to fix these fuel control problems and these systems when they're on a real engine that's running? Well, the fuel injection is part of an engine control system. This system will regulate the air intake on a drive-by-wire car, fuel and spark timing to achieve the desired performance in the form of torque or power power output. The driver of the vehicle will determine the power that they want, driver intent, by pushing on the accelerator pedal. Now the accelerator pedal can be monitored in, in many different fashions. In one fashion, I push the accelerator pedal and I'm directly coupled with a Bowden cable to the throttle valve. And the throttle plate is going to move depending on how I move my throttle. When I move the throttle plate, the TPS, the throttle position sensor, will be connected to a shaft that's in rotation. This will change a voltage output from the TPS. Now the TPS is going to be the interface between the user and the microprocessor. All microprocessors need some type of apparatus that would be an interim between the micro and the user. In this case, I'm going to use the TPS. So when it sees it rotate and it sees the speed of the rotation and how much, that is the request that will be processed by the microprocessor to make a torque output from the plant. The APPS, the Accelerator Pedal Position Sensor, is another type of monitor that I could have on the accelerator pedal. In this function, when I move the accelerator pedal, I know longer have a mechanical linkage between the accelerator pedal and the throttle blade. Now, this is a, strictly a request. When you push on the throttle pedal, you are requesting the microprocessor uh, do a task, open the throttle to a certain amount. But the program is, is the end, re, is the end Piece. The program is going to say whether that throttle can move wide open or it moves a partial amount of that. So this is only a request. In the other format with a Bowden cable, when I step on it, the throttle opens and the microprocessor has to react to that much air coming in. This is a little bit different system with a little bit different programming and rules that would be applied to this. All of the sensors on the vehicle take a physical quantity and convert it to into an electrical output, or what we would call a voltage. Microprocessors, however, don't see voltage or amperage or any of this. Microprocessors see something that's referred to as Boolean code. Boolean code is simply ones and zeros. And the placement of these ones and zeros in a string of code would give that microprocessor the understanding of what the voltage is. In this case, if I had 0.5 volts, I would have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. Now that binary code would indicate 0.5 volts. Now if I had 4 volts, I would have 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. Note that these are 8-bit ADCs. In other words, there's 8 placements that I can change or rearrange 1's and zeros. So that's what this is going to do. And this is going to tell the micro what voltage is coming in from any of the sensors that would be present. The driver intent in, in turn opens a throttle blade allowing more air to go into that engine. So at idle I have a restriction from the throttle plate. When this is closed, I have a negative pressure on one side and atmosphere on the other. When I open this throttle up, now I allow the air, the atmosphere, to rush in. The atmosphere is roughly 78-79% uh, and about 21% oxygen. The nitrogen is the working fluid for the engine and the oxygen is the oxidant to react with my fuel stock. So what's the fuel injection really doing? Well, it's calculating the amount of air that's going into the engine. It's commanding the injector on time. It's commanding the injector sequence. It's commanding the spark timing. And it's commanding the spark sequence. It also commands many other functions, such as cam phasing, um, possibly purge, vents, and so forth. The tasks will be run in a sub-loop in the back, or a sub-VI. 
and many of these things will be the main focus of the program to actually keep the engine running. We think about the fuel injection system about the fuel. However, the fuel injection system is really about the air, the air entering the engine. So really, let's start to think about this a little bit outside the box. It's not about the fuel, it's about the air. The fuel quantity is known. The air quantity is not known. So this is a big difference. If I know the fuel quantity, but I don't, need, but I don't know the air quantity, we're going to need to run some, some algorithms and some math so we could calculate how much air is entering the engine so we could control the fuel and timing and all the other things we were just looking at. The fuel injector has a known flow rate. This known flow rate is created by these orifices at the bottom of the injector. So if this pentel is moved up through an electromagnetic field, now the fluid from the fuel pressure will force fluid through those slots. The fuel pressure by the slot or the opening aperture or the uh, the hole diameter will set how much flow comes out of that injector. So if I buy these injectors, I buy these by the injector slope or the injector flow rate. And that's going to give me the weight of fuel that it will give in time. So don't get caught up in the math, get the idea. But if we had an injector flow rate of 46 pounds in one hour, 46 pounds in one hour would be 7.36 gallons of gasoline. One gallon of gasoline weighs 6.25 pounds at 70 degrees. One pound is equivalent to 37.85 cc's. So 6.25 times 37.85 gives me a flow rate of 23,656.25 cc gallon. And if I take 7.36 gallons and I multiply it by my, my overall weight, now I'm going to have 174,110 cc's an hour. Now I have something that we can work with. We have an hour, 60 minutes, one minute is 60 seconds. 60 seconds by 60 seconds is 3,600 seconds in an hour. Now each second has a 1,000 milliseconds in it. So now I can come down and we can figure out the millisecond time and we can see that this, this injector by the flow rate divided by the milliseconds is 0 0.0483 C's per millisecond. This is a known quantity. Any calibration engineer that's calibrating these vehicles is going to know that rate. They're going to pick the right injector for the horsepower of the engine, and the horsepower would be proportional to the air flowing into such an engine. So the airflow now is unknown. So we know that this injector will flow X amount if I open it up for so many milliseconds, but I don't know how much air is entering the engine. So we got to calculate that. There are two major ways that we run calculations. One is referred to as speed density and one is mass airflow. I might add that there's another one referred to as alpha N. Alpha N is using the throttle plate affected area and there's a calibration in all the computers where it would default to this. So if I lost my mass air sensor and I would revert to the absolute manifold pressure sensor to do speed density. Let's say we lost that one too. Now would we default to alpha N? And that would watch the TPS and it would give me where the throttle plate angle is and what that affected area is in the throttle bore and we could structure a program that would keep this car running relatively well. Each one of these systems will be programmed and then a secondary default will come in when the program deems that that sensor could no longer be trusted to be used for the injection system. Both the speed density and the mass airflow calculation will provide the air weight 
and this can be displayed on your scan tool in many cases is grams per second. However, these two air weights are very different. I mean very different. The way the calculation determines is quite different and we need to understand this. So the speed density method of measurement is it's looking at a vacuum or a negative pressure behind the throttle plate and that would be in the intake manifold. So if the throttle is closed I have a hose that would come over here or the map would be placed directly into the intake system and now when the throttle plate is closed I have a negative state of pressure, a vacuum on this side and I have atmosphere on this side. As I open this throttle up now the atmosphere rushes in. So as I open this throttle up the vacuum state or the negative pressure is going to change. Now if we look at the throttle plate opening and we see that we're, we had a large negative base at idle, we'll say 18 inches of mercury. And as we open the throttle, we would go 18, 15, 13, 10, 7, and so forth as we drop. As that atmosphere starts to rush in and fill the, the manifold with the atmospheric pressure, it would indicate I had more air in the engine. This is an indirect method of measurement. In other words, anything that would affect the vacuum would tell me that the, I had more air in the engine than I did. Such as if I had an EGR valve stuck open, the EGR would be diluting or taking some of the volume out of the induction system and my negative pressure would drift up towards atmosphere. Well the program would look at this and it would say more air was going into the engine than what actually went into the engine. So that wouldn't be good because then we would have a control issue. Now the manifold sensor is basically it's absolute so there's a vacuum inside here on a diaphragm and I expose this side to the intake manifold. When you hit the key on engine off it looks at the voltage and this becomes a barometric pressure in many cars. Now a mass air sensor is going to be a direct air measurement. I want to make one point. That mass air is always in front of the throttle blade. If the throttle blade is here, the mass is always in front of it. If a sensor is behind the throttle blade, it is speed density. There are some manufacturers that have a MAP sensor behind the throttle plate that they refer to as a mass airflow. On your scan tool it's referred as mass airflow and in your wiring diagrams it's referred to as mass airflow. And it does speed density calculates the mass air weight into the engine. But it's really speed density which works on a vacuum sensor where a mass air works from the direct measurement of, of air by the convection or air heating of the air or a fluid base and the air would be the fluid and as that air goes by these, these heated sensors it calculates by each molecule of air taking heat away from it it tells the molecular weight of the air. So these are very accurate sensors. Now, these are going to be two different ways that we have to know which one of these is on here. If we had a vacuum leak behind the throttle blade and that air got into the engine, so it's unmetered air. That means that air did not go by the sensor so the sensor did not weigh it. I would become lean because I have more air entering the engine than what the mass air sensor is telling the microprocessor that it can have. So what this is going to mean is I'm lean. If I have a speed density system and I give an air leak behind the throttle plate, the air actually got into the system and it raised the negative pressure towards atmosphere saying I had more air in there. I don't have any correction factor. In this I would have a correction factor. Now, if I had an EGR effect and I start to put dilute the intake manifold with exhaust gas that just means I wouldn't have as much air passing the mass air, which means it still read it correctly. I would not have a correction factor. 
However, on a speed density system, I, if I had an EGR open, I would have that negative state of pressure drift towards atmosphere and the microprocessor would say more air is in the engine than what really went into the engine and then I'm going to have a correction factor. These correction factors we will talk about will be the fuel trim factors. The mass air directly measures it. It has a hot uh, element in one way, either a hot wire or a heated element. Most of the newer sensors are a platinum film that's heated. And so this is going to work just a little bit differently than a speed density or alpha N. Each one of these systems has its own rules and its own way of operation. Once the total air has been weighed that's going to enter the engine, I have to determine how much air went into each cylinder. Since we deliver the fuel either into a port injected motor, that's a cylinder, or a direct injected engine, that's putting it into the cylinder. So the air weight has to be divided by the number of cylinders. So the, that way I can say how much air went into each cylinder. That's really what I need to do. So I can properly weigh the amount of fuel through the fuel control, that's an injector, and I can open and close it and allow the correct fuel flow into that particular cylinder. Don't get caught up in the math again, but we need an idea. So if we had an example for an eight cylinder at idle, the total air weight would be five grams. Now, what's gonna be really important is the basic air weight entering at idle. Hot unloaded idle, that means the engine is fully operated temperature, the throttle plate is closed, and I don't have any kind of air conditioning or fans on, everything is turned off. This gram weight will come very close to equaling the displacement of the motor. So if I have five grams, that's telling me I have a five liter engine. If I have two grams, I'm going to have about two grams. What this is, is the amount of air that's needed to overcome the parasitic loss of the, mo of the motor. We have both viscometric loss, that's pumping the oil pressure, and we also have the pumping cycles. So as the piston comes up and compresses that gas, that's work. And as the piston moves away from the head on an induction stroke, that's a suction throttling loss. These these strokes of the engine require a lot of energy. If you want to think about how much energy it is, all of us have tried to start a lawnmower. And the lawnmower won't start, and we're pulling and pulling and pulling. Every time you pull, you're spinning the engine, you're overcoming the parasitic loss of the pumping cycle, and that took energy in to overcome the pumping cycle. It just so happens that the liter size will be very close to the amount of air that's needed, so I have enough fuel in there to ignite and burn, and push the pistons down, and all we're trying to do at idle is overcome the parasitic loss of the motor. Most engines accomplish this very well, and it's a good trick. It's a rule of thumb. So roughly, the liter size will be equivalent to the gram weight moving into the motor. I have 800 RPMs divided by 60. I have 13.3 revolutions per second. 13.3 revolutions per second divided by four strokes. So this is a four-stroke engine. I only have one of the intake strokes, so if I had an eight-cylinder, I would need to divide it by four because each revolution, I only have four pulls. Now, our air weight would be five grams divided by 3.33 intake strokes per second. Now I have 1.50 grams of air per cylinder. Do you see how we've calculated, we've taken the mass air coming into the motor and now we've done an equation to where it tells me how much air is in each cylinder. Now I want a known fuel ratio. So let's say we have 14.7, which would be stoichiometric in most uh, fuel stocks, gasoline-based fuel stocks. Um, so now I'm going to have a fuel rate of 0.0, I'm sorry, 0.102. The 0.0 
0.102 fuel rate. Now we take that injector slope, remember we figured this out, 0 0.0483 cc's per millisecond. Now my injection time would be 2.11 milliseconds. But it takes time to get this injector open. It doesn't just open and we have instant flow. It's going to be about a millisecond of a delay or latency to move the pentel far enough up to where we establish a fuel flow out the tip of the injector. So we're going to add one millisecond of injector turn on time. This is the time to get the pentel up so we start flow. We would basically have 3.11 milliseconds of on time. Now let's take this same engine at wide open. Now we have 240 grams, so this is a pretty powerful motor to be able to produce a 240 gram pull. Now we do the same math down but now we have 9.60 grams of air per cylinder. We take that and we change our air fuel ratio because under load we no longer want stoichiometric. Now we want a richer mixture about 13, 12 and a half to 13 is, is pretty normal to produce power with. In this case we're going to take 13 to 1 and that will give me a fuel rate of 0.738 fuel rate. I take that by that same injector flow rate. It was known. It's always going to be used the same in the equation. Now I have an injector on time of 15.27 milliseconds and I've got to add a millisecond because we still have the same latency to move the pentel to establish a fluid flow rate out of that injector. So now I would have 16.27 milliseconds of on time. So this is the way the computer is calculating things so it knows what fuel rate to give into the motor. Notice that I do the air flow, I got to know it first. And then it takes the air flow and it breaks the air flow down so I know how much fuel to deliver to this engine. Since the engine control unit is calculating the air rate into the engine to deliver the fuel rate, the air becomes extremely important. For a quick accurate diagnosis, we really need to calculate the air rate going into the engine. This is what is known as the volumetric efficiency. Volumetric efficiency is the ability to pump air. So like a cylinder, if I had an air pump here and I pull it up, the air in rushes and now I have a large volume and then as I push it down I make a smaller volume and I push it out. How many times I can pump would tell me the quantity of air that I'm pumping or what we're going to refer to as the volumetric efficiency. The air in the engine can be calculated with a basic mathematical equation. So basically I need to know the liter size, the barometric pressure, the RPM, and the air temperature, and we can give you an equation that can approximate the air flowing. This is the equation, so NV, this is the volumetric efficiency, this is the air max actual and the air max theoretical, air max actual, and this would be the the density of the air, the displacement, the speed of the engine, and the revolutions and that would be basically, I'm going to divide it by the number of strokes, right? This would be basically an equation that can get me here. One of our instructors at WorldPAC wrote about this system and doing VE a long time ago in June 2003. So Mark already had this. Now one place you can go to get a volumetric efficiency calculator is ATG. There's other places if you Google it you'll find one. You can take your scan tool, you're going to set your scan tool up to make a movie. If your scan tool can't make a movie you need a new scan tool gentlemen. But we need to record the data and then we can come back and we can run a calculator and we can sort of get an idea. It's always going to be harder to do this with a calculation and a calculator across all the ranges that the air is going to flow. Sometimes a computer just makes some of this way easier. So for tooling, uh, you know, I can dig a hole with my hands, a spoon, a shovel, or a backhoe. They all produce the same hole. The difference is the amount of time and energy that I put in. I mean, when I'm working on a car, I want the backhoe. So what is volumetric efficiency? What would an engine that you're working on have? 
So the volumetric efficiency is the engine swept volume. That's the displacement per cylinder, the number of cylinders, the RPM, and then the induction strokes that are available would give me 100% VE. So let's say that I had a six liter engine and I rolled the crank two revolutions or one complete fire cycle, I would have 100% VE would be I had six liters pumped. But there's other factors that we need to come in and we need to look at. So some of these are the air density. So if I'm minus 40 to 104 Fahrenheit, this is a 35% difference of air weight. If I got a barometric pressure, well, going from, from a sea level elevation to 10,000 feet, that's 39% difference. So we're going to have a vast difference on elevation and temperature, not counting on any of the other things like cam configuration, intake mass full port configuration, intake valve sizes, combustion chamber geometries, exhaust valve sizes, exhaust port configurations, and exhaust pipe configurations. All of these can change the volumetric efficiency and where that all volumetric efficiency is at its highest. If I've got a soccer mom's car, I want the volumetric efficiency as high as I can have it down low uh, two to four thousand RPM. That is where you drive the car, so that's going to be where it's going to feel best. If I have a BMW, I bought a spaceship. I want a rocket. That means I want my highest volumetric efficiency towards the max red line, so I make the maximum amount of horsepower and torque. That might be somewhere from four to 7,000 RPM. Each engine is going to be configured differently based on many different aspects of what the engineering team is trying to accomplish. Accomplish. Most naturally aspirated engines will have about 88 to 90 percent. This is a really common number. So most of the engines we work on, it's 88 to 90 percent. Some of the high performance engines, they can have 93 to 99 percent, and that's a really high amount. I have seen engines in production that can be as high as 120, and those are really, really rare. Most of the engines that we work on are around the 90% range. So how do we use the VE to fix the vehicle? So now we have the, the air input into the vehicle and we need to get a calculation. So by calculating the volumetric efficiency, that's going to be a theoretical or an engine model, and we compare it to the mass airflow actual, what's being reported from the engine control unit. Now we compare these two. So in this graph, the yellow is what's actually coming from the mass airflow sensor, the red trace in the background, that is a theoretical airflow or an engine model done by mathematics. In order to do this, we can see that this is, is a scan tool, and this is referred to as the e-scan. And this does this whole system for you. Not that you need it, but you do need a VE calculator. Now, we do this whole system for you, so now the yellow trace is what? It's what's actually being reported from the microprocessor. So this is the reading from the mass air, and the red trace is, a, is an engine model. So we take hundreds and hundreds of engines and we build models for them known on what that engine's capability of airflow could be. In this case, we can see the difference between the red, the engine model, and what actually is being pumped is put over on this table. And you can see that they're green. That means they're, they're close enough together to where the engine is pumping the right amount of air. So the engine control module is weighing the air and then it's delivering the fuel. We've seen this in the equations. So the fuel weight into the engine is given based on the air weight that's going into the motor. This is referred to as feed forward. In other words, I have to find the air weight first and then I deliver the fuel rate. This is the way all these systems are going to be in operation. 
So in a feed-forward system, if anything is incorrect, there's really no way to fix it. We all have worked on some of the early Volkswagen BOSS systems, and in those systems, if the head temperature sensor would fail, the car wouldn't run. It had no way to back up or to figure out anything else. If the air door had a problem or there's a leak, it couldn't fix it. There's no feedback. It took the quantity of what it was weighing in air and all temperatures and then it gave that fuel. If something went wrong, the car just wouldn't run very well. So what we need to do is we need a way to fix this base equation, the air equation, so the fuel delivery can be modified. So this is going to be what we're going to do, and we're going to accomplish this by weighing the weight of fuel to air. And at stoichiometry, we'd have 14.7 to 1. So now, to, do, to weigh it, we need to use another sensor. This is going to be a, the oxygen sensor, and this is a narrow band oxygen sensor, or a wide range air fuel sensor. Although this oxygen sensor has a wider range, as we'll talk about shortly, the oxygen sensor is going to weigh the air fuel ratio and send this data to the microprocessor. Now the sensor can't do anything with the data. It can only say the weight the fuel is. The microprocessor has to deal with the data by giving more or less fuel. This is only reporting it like it was a scale. And if I had the fuel on one side and the air to the other and I scaled it, and this scale was sent to the microprocessor, it's telling me the weight of air to fuel. That's what wideband O2 sensors and oxygen sensors will do. So now if I've got more air than fuel, I'm lean. Now that if I've got more fuel than air, I'm rich. So now I have a way to monitor what the feed forward system. The feed forward system gave fuel based on a base equation and now I can test it. I test this with an exhaust style gas sensor and that sensor is going to tell the computer something so I can correct for it. Good fuel control on a oxygen sensor is going to basically be bouncing between 0.2 and 0.8. Anything in this window is going to be very close to stoke. So I need to be greater than 0.8 to be rich and I need to be less than 0.2 volts to be lean. Everything that's in between this is pretty much stoke. And the engineering teams use this as a switch. And is it switching up and down? That gives me my ability. These sensors have some problems. One is if they're not totally hot above 700 degrees Fahrenheit, these sensors won't have a very good output. And that output can give me some problems. So in this case, if I'm greater than 0.8, I'm rich. And if I'm leaner than 0.2, I'm lean. But everything in between is just a switch and it's telling it, if I keep it in that window, I'll be stoked. And that's what it's really looking for. The four wire zirconium oxygen sensor that we use, <coughs> excuse me, is really a wide band sensor and the reason we say that this is not a narrow band, it, we call these narrow bands, but when you read the papers they're talking about this reading accurately really from 11 to 1 to 17 to 1 in the lean. Well these are pretty big readings guys so this is the range that we run the car in so that's why a lot of cars still have this type of sensor because it can be worked it can work very well. So the engine control model module then uses this data to make changes to the fuel injector on time. First we calculate the air weight and what we're going to put the fuel weight it's based on the air it's a feed forward we then check the oxygen sensor or the RAF sensor and we give a feedback system to where we can make a correction factor. You can think about this as an oven. An oven has a user interface and I set a dial. If I set it to 350, that's what the user wants. That's the intent. Now I would have a sensor inside the heated element or inside the heated area. 
this temperature sensor would just tell the control module what the temperature of the oven is. The control module then would turn on the electric element and it would heat up the interior of the oven. So as I heat it up, I would come up to a hit a, a point, we'll say it would be 355. I shut it off and it cools down to 345. It heats up again and cools down. This is referred to as a limit cycle system. And doesn't this look a lot like an oxygen sensor? Because it is. This system works very much like an oxygen sensor being limited. I go high, I go low, and as long as I stay in the ranges, I'm very accurate to keep very close to the 350 target point. We can sort of see this here as the oven burner is coming on and off I'm heating up and cooling down, heating up and cooling down and what we're really trying to obtain is a target plane and we can obtain that target plane within 1%. This is a recording from an actual vehicle. The Yellow is the fuel trim and the blue is the oxygen sensor. Note they work in inverse proportional to each other. In other words, when the oxygen sensor goes down low, being lean, before it can actually be lean, the fuel system control comes up and adds fuel. Then I go rich or I go above 0.45 and then I go I drive the fuel control lean. Short term fuel is actually maintaining my uh, my target. In this case, if this was idle and this where this was taken, this would be at 14.7 to 1 or about stoichiometric. And the 14.7 to 1 is a moving target. It would depend on the blend of fuel and the fuel constituents. 14.66 to 1 is what they base this off of and that's based on trimethylpentane which is referred to as isooctane. And we don't run pure isooctane. So we could have a target anywhere from about 14 5 to 14, 7 in the real world when we go down and we buy gas at our local gas stations. The fuel trim and the control of the fuel, this is going to be the feedback. So fuel trim is giving feedback or short term or long term and that's going to change my fuel correction. So now we have a feed forward that we have some way to correct so we can keep the engine running better. So the fuel trim is the control and we're going to, that's the feedback. So fuel trim is really changing the amount of air to fuel through the fuel trim by lengthening it and shortening it. Now we want to take a really quick look. This is the eight cylinder that we looked at earlier. We've already looked at this. We had 3.11 milliseconds of on time. Now let's have an air leak. So the air was unmetered air that went behind the throttle plate. Now the total air is four grams, but it really should be five. We're 800. We did the exact same equation that we did before, but now we only have 2.67 a milliseconds seconds, but we need more time, more on time. So we got to fix this. So if we take the fuel trim of 16.5 percent and I multiplied it by the 267, I would add 44 milliseconds. So the trim of 16.5 gives me an on time correction of 0.44 milliseconds plus my time. Now I have the 3.11. Again, I targeted to keep the air-fuel mixtures correct. The VE table, this is the load by RPM. So in this case, we're going to fill these cells up and this is going to give me a three-dimensional plane. If I come in here and I put numbers in here, what that really is, is that's a way to make a three-dimensional map. So when they show you these type of, of mountains and so on, for fuel control and ignition control, that's just a flat table that I've put numbers in. That's all we got to think about. It's really a basic system there. Now that we have the winning equation and we understand a little bit of how this is working, let's apply this to real vehicles. I have a 2003 Kia Sorento. Here's my Kia. So we have a 3.5 liter engine in this. We have DTCs for the 
lean air fuel, both banks. We have two rebuilt mass sensors have been put on the car. They put one on, they put another one on, they've replaced all the O2s twice, and they've repaired air leaks. They've removed the, the intake manifold and resealed it basically. Here's my car. Now, here's my codes and so on, and I also have a not code. Guys, stay Focus. Don't get caught up in all these DTCs. Stay on what is wrong with the car. The car's got lean codes. Well, the lean might make a knock, or they might have disconnected the knock sensor when they redid the, ma the intake manifold. I don't know. I'm here, and I do symptom diagnostics. When I work on a car, I'm always looking at the symptom, and I always work on the symptom. Unless the symptom isn't present. In in other words, if I have an EVAP leak, I can't see that as a symptom, so the check engine lamp and the code now becomes my symptom. But if I've got a lean engine, that's my symptom. So that's what we're going to look at here. So now, at idle, we have a 3.6 grams per second. Now we have a 3.5 V6 engine, right? So that would say that that's right. But on Kia and Hyundai, I'm going to warn you guys that many of these Kias and Hyundais need more air to overcome the parasitic loss of the motor. So I don't know if this is one of the ones that is normal and that would be okay or it's one that needs let's say uh, 4 grams or 4.2 grams of air to overcome the parasitic loss. So this number on this engine I've got a sort of question. I'm not sure if it's right or wrong, but I can see right now that I have trims on both banks. These are long-term trim numbers. That means I have a correction factor. I weighed the air going in, and if this should be four grams and it's three six, I'm making up because that air weight wasn't right. So these are adding to the air. Remember, the fuel trim is multiplied the base air equation so to get more fuel trim I multiply the air by the fuel trim factor and it tells me I have more air and if I need more air what do you get more fuel if I multiply this by a negative number now I take away air I get less fuel the fuel trim is actually multiplying the base air equation and I'm changing the air uh, the air weight in the, micro, in the microprocessor in the program to deliver more or less fuel as a correction factor. So here we've got some basic data. Always go drive the car. Always record your data so I can go back and look at it. Now when I drive the car, I want to just keep it a cruise and I want to watch the oxygen sensor and I want to make sure that it can bounce. What are where our windows? I want to go 0.2 to 0.8 because that's where these work. Above 0.8, I'm rich, and below 0.2, I'm lean. That's what the computer sees. So if I drive this and I'm bouncing up and down, I'm okay. Now, always accelerate the car to wide open throttle. You can see this V. I climbed up through first gear, took a first gear shift, and then I got out of it. Now the oxygen sensor stayed rich the entire time. Now, if this is bouncing up and down and I can hold the fuel level above 0.8, I have fuel control. So if I said that I had a fuel uh, enrichment of 30% plus 30, would that mean the engine is lean? No, it doesn't. It means the engine is, stoichio is stoichiometric. It's within my window. The target for my movement of the fuel trim, as long as I stay in the window, all the fuel trim is trying to do is get the right fuel to air weight. So that's all. So now, I want to, to load a chart. Always look at your fuel trims dynamically. That means that I need to look at them under a load. Always. Guys, I go to so many shops to help them, 
and they, they haven't done the fuel trim correctly. So what they do is they're sitting in their bay and they think they're going to see a fuel trim issue. You have to move through these cells. In the microprocessor, there is a chart like this and you go into a load by RPM and this is where it remembers the fuel trim. Once, it, once it's learned the fuel trim, it keeps it in the window. That way if you jumped up to 50% throttle at 3000 RPM, it's not trying to get the fuel trim again, which would make my car have a problem. It goes into the cell and it already knows what to give there. So what we're going to do with the e-scan is we're going to load these cells while you go drive the car. Now, I want to look at about 40% and I got 24% and I want to go up above like 80%, 70-80% and here I've got 36%. Here on this bank I've got 22 to 36. Now right now I'm not sure what's wrong because this could be maybe I've got some kind of a plug fuel filter. As I loaded it, I got better. But these numbers down at the bottom wouldn't indicate a plugged fuel filter because that would mean I had a very low rate. So this would be telling me something else. But really what I need is I need an error measurement because the whole program is based off of air. So here, I'm going to take the volumetric efficiency. The yellow trace is what's actually being reported from the microprocessor. That is what the mass air sensor read in weight. And then the microprocessor used that weight calculation and now the scan tool retrieved it. We're going to compare the actual VE against the, uh, what a theoretical model of the engine would be. Now, now the model says I should have 130 grams, I only have 95. That is a 35% difference. Now isn't that what we just saw, that we have 36%? That's because the air weight was misread by the mass air. The fuel trim is making up for the air. The air was under read. The fuel trim multiplied the air to tell it I had more air so I could keep the fuel corrections correct. That's what fuel trim is really doing. So this is just showing you how this is going to work. Now, I know what's wrong. I drove around the block. I've got five minutes of driving time in this car and I know I have a problem on the air side. If it was a fuel problem, I would have fuel trims, but the air would have read right. But the air did not read right. The air under read, the fuel trim is correcting the base air equation so I can keep control of my fuel. Now, I need to take a scope and I need to get into this mass air and we need to check it. In order to do that, this I want to make sure that I have my voltage and I have my ground and I have no voltage drops. <coughs> This is my signal. I'm going to snap the throttle, wham, and then I'm going to do it again, wham. This peak right here is the inrush of air. That's what I'm interested in. I'm going to blow that up and I want to measure where I was at idle to where I came to the peak in this first ramp up. This will be very close to the maximum VE of the engine because we have a high pressure differential because the throttle blade is closed. I have a heavy negative pressure on one side and atmosphere on the other. When I snap at the inrush of air will give me a high reading. Now I want to measure the difference and the difference between these is 2.3 volts. Okay guys, you have a 5 volt sensor on the car, right? If you're an engineer, would you use 2 volts or 1 volt if I had 5? I at least want 2526 minimum. I'm really looking for about 27 or greater. This has to do with I have more voltage to write a calibration table. If I can write a greater calibration table, now I can make sense of this. So these numbers at 2 are 2.3, they're too low. I want them up towards 27 or so. And that tells me at least I'm in a range of what some calibration team would work. These are rules of thumb. Now, I went back in and I told the owner of the shop, man, you need, you need a new mass sensor. He says, I, I got those ones. I said, no dude, you need a new mass air. Those are rebuilt ones. You need a new one. So, a new one is $800. 
He charged 200 for the rebuilt, 250. Who's going to pay the difference? So I was just down at one of the salvage yards working on a car that they had put back together and I saw that they had one of these cars. I called the salvage owner, the owner of the yard, and I said, hey man, does that have a, a mass air? He said, it does. I said, I'm going to send these guys down. They went down and got the used one. I went across the street to a tranny shop and I was working on a tranny. When they got the used one, I went back and I got it. So now we're going to put the used one in. I would rather use a used mass air sensor rather than one that's been rebuilt. So now I'm going to snap the throttle and now I'm going to do the same measurement and I'm going to measure it and we can see that we have 2.75 volts. Okay, that's in my window. I'm okay now. Let's do another test. So basically, if we did this, we would find basically that we would have one gram of air is equal to 22 millivolts. Now some of these engines will be 10 millivolts will be a gram of air. So it depends on the system and how much airflow the engine can have. But that's always the difference between, let's say, at an idle and wide open, the voltage is going to be how we're going to figure this out. So now that we've got this running, I have four grams. Okay, I'm okay with that. Four grams, that might be on a Kia or a Hyundai. So now we've got a higher air weight. Now I'm going to go do a VE test. If I didn't do anything else to this vehicle and I have these two towers, do you see how they're overlaying each other and the table's green? I have fixed the problem because now the mass air is delivering or telling the computer the right airway to it. Now we give the feed forward and we delivered it. We don't need much feedback. I drove the car around the block. Guys, stop clearing the codes. I go to all these shops, I do a mobile service, and everyone's cleared the codes 10 times. Fix the car and drive it and see if the data is driven in the, in the factor where we know that it's going to be fixed. Then clear the codes. When you clear the codes, you dump all kinds of data, mode 6, there's all kinds of things we don't want to do that for. So here, we basically do you see how we're starting to get these trims correct? Now notice how some of these are green and some of these are still red down here. So the fuel control trim is a product of fire cycles by authority. When I say fire cycles, if I tuned a car and I said for every 100 fire cycles move a percentage of trim, now I would have a very unstable car. I don't have enough fire cycles to get a large fuel change. So one way to do this is I would do 500 fire cycles and maybe I give a quarter percent. Or I would give 200 fire cycles and I give a quarter percent. So many of the cars will chase fuel trim like GM, Toyota, they chase it. Ford and Honda are really slow. All Ford and Honda did is they have more fire cycles to the trim authority. It takes longer to trim the motor. So we don't have a, a, a drivability problems and idling problems where the tack fluctuates and the customer might be unhappy with that and return the car to the OE under a warranty. So basically the cells, you got to get an eat cell and you have to have enough fire cycles in that cell with the fuel trim authority to drive it and now you can see these are the cells that I've been in longer so they cleared. I'm not looking to clear the whole chart. I know I'm going to fix it so if I clear the codes and I return it I know I'm good. We have a 2000 BMW 740IL. This car is unfixable. This car has been trying to be fixed for over two years. The part list on this car is incredible. Several, several DEMs have been put in the car. Uh, pumps, oxygens, you can name it, they put it into the car. Let's look at what's wrong. Now that we understand how the fuel system works, we can fix this car in under 20 minutes. This is my car. Now, we've got this this list right here is what the shop I'm working for has put into it. This isn't the OE. They've, or no, the dealerships, they've put microprocessors in this. This is just the shop I'm working for. So I'm going to take the e-scan and we're going to go for a test drive. First off, it's got four grams hot unloaded idle. That is too low on this car. This should have 4.4, 4.6. Now if I have low air at idle and 
and I have 20% added idle, that's because this is under reading the air and the fuel trim is multiplying the base air equation telling it I have more air so I can give the proper fuel to it. Always drive the car. Notice that I'm in fuel control on both banks and when I accelerate hard I stayed rich. That means that we have fuel control. So we're not outside of our fuel control. So we're good here. So now we have the fuel control and we're okay. Now, what we need to do is drive the car dynamically. At idle I have 21%, at light load I have 21%, and at wide open I have 21%. This is going to limit what the cars, what could be wrong with the car. Did you see how the other car, it goes from 20 to 36, 24 to 36, it's not linear. Linear is where I put a point and I put another point and I draw a line. There's hardly anything that happens on a car that's linear. The power curves, the ability of air being pumped, those are all non-linear curves, but here I got a linear curve. The fuel injectors, that orifice size against the fuel pressure, that's linear. If the orifice size is wrong or the fuel pressure is wrong, I can have a linear equation. If the mass air is wrong, I can have a linear problem. Or if the transfer function table. A transfer function table is where I normalize the reading from the sensor. In other words, I convert the voltage back into air weight. In the microprocessor, I have a grid and it says this voltage equals this amount of air. This voltage equals this amount of air. The engineering teams at the OE take the heads in the entire intake system all the way out to the air filter and they put it on a flow bench. They flow air through the head and they watch how much air weight is going through it and then that voltage given by that mass air it says two volts is equal to this amount of air well they know how much air is flowing through it because it's on a flow bench and they build a complete chart like this that's a transfer function table transfer function tables are all throughout the microprocessor to do all your sensors because a sensor only makes a voltage the voltage has to be normalized into what the reading would be this is linear. What I need to know, what's the missing piece right now? It's the air, guys. I need to know the air. So if I come over here and I get the actual air rate and I compare it to the theoretical model, 21, 21, 21. Doesn't that mirror this 21, 21, 21? That tells me that the problem is on the air side. It's not fuel delivery. It's not the injectors. So it's not in the fuel delivery side. It's in the air side and if it's in the air side now I know <coughs> it has to be the mass air sensor or the lookup table so now I want to get on the mass air so I'm going to take my scope and we're going to get on this mass air sensor here's my mass air we're going to get into him and we're going to read him and I'm going to snap it and when I snap this I have 2.6, that, guys, that's close to my target. I'm not sure. But thank, thankfully, I'm at a German-only shop. There is a car just like the one I'm working on just over here in the lot. I went in, I asked the owner for the keys to that car. I went over and I got a reading from that car. Okay, now I have 3.86 volts. Now there's a big discrepancy between my car and this car. Now this is the actual voltage out of the sensor. So it, it can't be the transfer function table now. It has to be a problem with this mass air sensor. I want you to notice this bung is welded in right here and this is a metal this is hot rod bull right that's always the ones that get the shops it's sabotage someone has put a high flow air system in this car but they didn't change the calibration for it so how does that work that sensor is a really expensive sensor this sensor costs the NOE a lot of money to make. 
So what's going to end up happening is I make one sensor and to make it work across a wide variety of cars, I change the bore size. If I make the bore smaller, the velocity is higher. If I make the bore bigger, the velocity is slower. But when I change the velocity, the output from this sensor will also change. That being said, I'm going to need to match the bore size with the output in the transfer function function table. Now what happened is when they put on this different mass air bore, they didn't program the car for it. And when the dealerships put on the new DEMs, they programmed a stock program back into it. They never changed the program for the bigger bore of the mass sensor. When they put a mass sensor in it, they didn't take the bore off or they'd have fixed it. They left that bore and they pulled the mass in and out of it. Now be aware that all kinds of companies, Ford uses one sensor for a four, six, eight, and 10 cylinder engine. They just changed the bore size. There's a mathematical equation referred to as the, the semi-empirical King's formula. It will calculate the velocity by the bore so you can put different bore sizes and you know the speed of the air going through it. So this, these just aren't that hard to fix, guys. You can also do all kinds of other type of things where if you have a plugged exhaust or you have a cam out, your trim to the air flow function is going to change. So we can see exhaust restriction, cam timing. We can see fueling problem. If we had a fuel problem, the VE would read correct, but the fuel trim would be wrong. If we had any kind of or a oxygen sensor or RAF sensor, the RAF reading incorrectly would create a problem that would show up in trim but the air would have read correctly. If you ever want to check a feedback system, you need a five gas analyzer. You take the five gas analyzer, you put it in the tailpipe, you read the tailpipe, and if you have a lambda of one, whatever happened in the correction factor with either a RAF sensor or an oxygen sensor, the feedback and the, and the injectors and fuel pressure, they all got to be working because it could fix the problem and it made stoichiometric or a lambda of one. It's a really quick way to check the whole feedback system in five or ten seconds. Why wouldn't we have these tools so we, we don't beat our head against the cars? I go to so many shops that struggle. This stuff is easier than we think. We just got to start thinking outside the box and we got to start to think about this, how engineers program things and how engineers think. So that being said, I'm ready to take your questions now. Thank you so much for your time this evening.